thank you all for coming back in. Um, now I'm holding my breath. Did we all lose our steam? And why do we have enough coffee? We can keep the conversation going. I guess we'll find out by, by seeing show of hands. What kind of questions did we come up with while we're out there? We've got our panel back here, and we really want to be in a position to not necessarily stand up here and say, here are the answers, because we don't have the answers. We can give you all tools. We can give you the benefit of our research. We can give you guys what's happening down at URI. But as I said in answer to a question earlier this <coughs> afternoon, this morning, uh, you're the frontline defense out there. Uh, land use is a local prerogative. And like it or not, unfortunately, you guys are on the front line. So how can we help you out? So ask away. We've got some great proposals. Yes, ma'am. Um, that I've looked into that somewhat moving forward with my research, and some of it's spelled out by statutory obligations. Maintaining a, a road, a highway, is controlled by statute, and to abandon that, you have to hold a public hearing, so on and so forth. And what's interesting about that is, in the cases that exist so far, the um, duty to notify and the parties that have had standing to challenge how well a town is holding up road infrastructure have been people that up on the section of road. There hasn't yet been case law looking at a section of road that's necessary for people downstream to gain access to the house. So that's still an area that hasn't been developed in the case law before. Yes, sir. I have a follow-up on to that. Um, there was a picture at the very beginning of, uh, of a flooded parking lot, um, and, there was, and, it, and it was stated that the flooding took place because backfilling of the storm drain, and I'm curious about, if I have a storm drain, I know it's going to be um, underwater uh, in 20 years. Uh, what's the town's liability for <coughs> for fixing that? I mean, what if it cost $10 million well, bucks to, to uh, change that whole storm? Jenny, that seems yeah. to be right up your alley because that's an affirmative duty. I Once you build it, you better build it right. <laughs> there's more than one picture that showed cars underwater, so you know clearly that's that's a problem. So, is your question if your storm drain is making the problem worse? Yeah. Then, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that's exactly the situation that I was getting at in my presentation. That if you had never built the storm drain there. You could maybe argue this is you know, more an act of God, something beyond the city's control. But once you build the storm drain, if it's making the flooding worse, then I think there's a much stronger argument for a plaintiff to say the city needed to do something to expand the system or do something else to try to ameliorate the flooding. So your question about it being $10 million or whatever cost it would be, um, I think that gets to the breach question, you know, where you have to start to think about what are your resources? What else might that 10 million go to? Are there other things you could do that, the, that are more cost effective? Um, and what kind of damage would you be preventing by spending the 10 million? If you're gonna prevent way more damage than that, then maybe it's, you know, you should do it. So it is very fact specific. I don't have, I can't obviously predict how a specific case would turn out, but I think all of those factors would be relevant. Um, and yeah, to the extent that you can do things that are cheaper. It wouldn't necessarily mean expanding the storm system itself, right? If there are more indirect ways you can prevent the flooding um, through, I think in the Chicago case, they said there should have been sandbags put in place when they knew the storm was coming. You know, there are other things, but it's a good question. I mean, those are exactly yeah. the things you should be thinking about. Or maybe perhaps I can make sure that it is a COT's problem and not. <laughs> There's always that. Andy, you want to follow up? Yeah, I mean, my question is, all right, we've, we're doing this all the time, every new subdivision, so forth. We're getting drainage easements. And nowadays, they're likely to be flowing into swales rather than storm drains. But either way, we're getting drainage easements that allow us to drain our roads onto your private property, and that's what they're for, for their purpose of draining the water. And we don't specify not more than so many gallons per minute or something. We just have an open-ended drainage easement. So if the weather is getting worse, and the flooding is getting worse, and we're draining more water. Is there really any municipal liability if we have an easement that gives us a, as long as we don't tie in more roadway to it, as long as it's just 
God that's bringing more water. If it's just more climate at, that way, why would there be liability for the town? I, because I think the town, by creating that storm drain in the first place, has created a dangerous condition. Despite the fact that that condition didn't exist when the town first built the storm drain, it's now becoming a dangerous condition because of increased precipitation and flood conditions in general. So I think based on what I've seen both in Rhode Island and elsewhere, the way the waivers of immunity are written and the way the statutes define uh, duty, it could easily be read into that. It doesn't say that there's a dangerous condition at the time the infrastructure was built. It says there's a dangerous condition that the city knows about, created, and failed to warn or remedy, right? So even if that condition was created later, I mean, this happens like with sidewalks, there's a crack in the sidewalk. It wasn't built that way in the first right. place. It happened later. Right. But, I'm, but I'm not talking about a failure in design. I'm not talking about, right. you know, I understand. If, if, if we've got the storm drain and it gets clogged up and it backs up or if it cracks and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But let's say it's functioning just fine. It's just carrying more water than it originally <coughs> needed. Mm -hmm. It's handling, it was built to oversized capacity anyway, so it's still handling it. Um, it's just flowing more water. Right, but it's channeling it. more water into, a pl and it's causing property damage because of that? Sure, this, this swale which used to only have water in it. The swale which used to be the tension pond ends up becoming a retention pond because there's so much water. <coughs> more the storm drain is, is um, 20 years from now, the storm drain is uh, underwater. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that's, look at the St. Bernard Parish case, right? They built this canal to be 500 meters, it became 1,500, and it's channeling way more water, right? I mean, it's, it's somewhat analogous to what you're saying. I think that the city, the Army Corps of Engineers, the federal government, didn't cause the storm. They didn't, ca nobody, maybe even, you could argue they shouldn't have predicted it. but. That channel, that canal, caused the water to go where it did. The water was going to come anyway, but it... But, but the liability came from the failure to maintain mm -hmm. the canal at the designated yeah. width. So, like in your analogy with the drainage thing, if we had a swale and the swale got much bigger, mm -hmm. then right, our liability is we failed to maintain our drainage thing. But, it, well, but I know that 20 years from now, if the alcohol is going to be underwater. Yeah. I know about that. Is that the same liability? I think it's a risk, yeah. yeah. It's not black and white. Right? I mean, it's definitely, it depends on the facts. It depends on all of these things. How much, how much has precipitation increased since you built it? How much is the capacity? Is it properly maintained? All of that. But I think that's definitely something that would open you up to some risk of liability. Yeah, yeah it, it, seems, it seems to me that the, what we're seeing here uh, and I'm, I've heard it this morning, I heard it this afternoon, is what, I think someone said it best a few minutes ago, what used to be an act of God, which was a complete shield, is now becoming an act of government, perhaps because of sea level rise and because of all this information we have, and does that whole idea of foreseeability raise to the level of an affirmative duty? Now, we don't have seen many courts that have said that yet, and I know there's a lot of folks out there that are saying their cities and towns are recalcitrant or whatever word you want to use. They don't want to hear about telling people no. They don't want to hear about tearing houses down. They don't want to hear about regulations that are uh, not going to allow building after a storm. But if the courts are going in this direction, and as you heard from John and other speakers, we're seeing that. If it becomes an affirmative duty where you all, all your municipalities, your frontline folks, have to start taking into consideration that sea level is rising and you have to do something about that, and if not, you're gonna be liable, then, then you could, something's gonna to have to be done, and that's why we're here. We want to share with you our ideas, but you, but you need to give us the feedback so we can implement it. There, what, Mike, there was a woman up here that had a question, hand up before you. Um, the 
other thing is, it's we have so many experts in this tiny state. I mean, like here, GSO, it's unbelievable. I'm wondering if a kind of a, a bank could be pulled together of who these experts are, and if they'd be willing to come in at the request of the town, if they would charge, if they wouldn't, maybe that would be a great kind of To answer thing. your question, the experts, yes, yeah, called the Beach Samp team. And that's what they've been trying to do for a couple of years now. And with this outreach to cities and towns, this meeting included, we're trying to do that. We're trying to educate you folks. We're trying to say we've got this wealth of knowledge. And now with the lawyers, you guys, <coughs> voicing your opinions and chiming in as to how you'd like to use some of this information to best defend a potential cause of action in the future, maybe we can come up with some kind of technical assistance program or some kind of legislative package that'll give you the, le the uh, legal support that you'd need so Don doesn't have to fly all these experts out to the Block <laughs> Island. They still have to fly them out. They still have to fly them out. <laughs> Mike. Yeah, um, there's a difference between takings and tort. And you know when I hear about this case out of uh, Louisiana, uh, Bernard Parish, St. Bernard Parish versus uh, the Corps of Engineers, and the MIV uh, or Ms. RIV Go project. And I hear about uh, failure to maintain and channeling the waters. All of that's negligent stuff. Mm -hmm. It is. Okay? That's it negligent is. stuff. That's not taking stuff. And what, 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 you know, I don't know anything about the case other than what you told But what troubles me about that case isn't so much that the judge might hold that there's liability, but that the judge would hold that there's takings liability. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Because that completely obliterates the distinction which must be there between takings and tort. <clears throat> if there is liability on the government there, which I think is a terrible stretch from the beginning, but nonetheless, it should be under a tort theory that the government somehow neglected its duties. You say, well, what difference does it make? Liability is liability. Well, I think it makes a Two big differences. Number one, there's a practical difference. Under tort, you have your tort claims act defenses. You know, you have this cap on liability. You have no attorney's fees. You have no interest. Now, I know this is a Louisiana case, not a Rhode Island case, but no, you know, generally under tort claims act, you have all kinds of you know technical uh, limits that maybe are lost on the layperson, but are, are actually important to, you know to the lawyer. But the second thing is that it really creates. Uh, a vagueness to the whole takings doctrine, such as it will subsume all tort. It absolutely if you, does. If you fall on the sidewalk because the city hasn't maintained the sidewalk because there's a crack, and you know, is that a, a, an invasion of property or is that just a garden variety tort? It's a tort, you know. It's like it's like an auto accident or anything like that. And if you happen to tear your overcoat, which is property. In the course of falling on the sidewalk, is that all of a sudden converted into taking? <laughs> if that's the case, then you've just constitutionalized every possible claim that there might be against the government. And that's, I think that's a very dangerous I thing. think uh, that's a very astute yeah. observation for several points. One, that you picked up on, and two, that is what I was going to talk about if I got to my slideshow. And basically, what happened here is that the St. Bernard Parish District Court case, Judge, down there, took her guidance from the United States Supreme Court in the Arkansas case. And if you read this five-pronged test the U.S. Supreme Court promulgated in the Arkansas case, you'll see that it smacks of a <coughs> constitutional tort, if you will. It's negligence, but it's under the guidance of a takings. Yeah. And that's where the right. sacred nine out of Washington decided to go with this thing. So a lot of that it can't be blamed upon uh, the district court judge in the lawns, but a lot of it goes to the Supreme Court in Washington. Yeah, and, and you're not the you're not the only person who holds that opinion for sure. I think um, John Echiaveri. Echiaveri. Yeah. Uh, oh, I have Wait, no idea. I've only seen he, it in writing. Thank you. He worked with us at Pellis. Oh, okay. So you know, yeah, he wrote he wrote on his blog the same thing basically that you just said. And you know, as I said, it's only one or two cases that have done this. It, we don't know. They may appeal and lose, right? This could be the end. But yeah, I agree with you 100. percent It's blurring that line, definitely. Well, the only thing is, I, you know, and not to make this look like a lawyer's reform, but Arkansas Game and Fish Commission, which I think was a bad decision, nonetheless, yeah. it is the law. It, 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 it did have the notion of a float, which called in common law, flow of easement, which is 
the right to flood the land of another, mm -hmm. which was a recognized common law form of easement, where you would have an interest in property that you were arguably taking. But a guy ripping his overcoat, where's the, you know, the exactly. title yeah, there? And I would say that a one-time event where this uh, canal channels the waters and, and uh, happens victims, you know, that's more like a I mean, I, I don't know if I would draw the distinction about it being a one-time event. Right. Like, I think, though, um, St. Bernard, Bernard Parish did go a lot further than Arkansas Fish and Game, yeah. because Arkansas Fish and Game basically held that temporary flooding caused by a government. Slide up there, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if it, I was just going to say it in a slightly different okay, way. Okay, no, go ahead. That, that the temporary flooding is not um, categorically exempt from takings right. analysis, right. right? But I think in that case, it was a more affirmative government action where they like opened Definitely. the dam, yeah. right? And that's. It was repetitive. It was, yeah, it was oh yeah, that's, that's true. That's true. Right. Yeah. They could flood it this year, they could flood it next year, they could flood it the year Right. After. But I, I would say, even if they just flooded it once, still, it's the government saying we're opening this dam. Whereas in St. Bernard Parish, there wasn't a moment at which the government did something and caused the flooding. So I, I agree with you. And I think. It's questionable. It's definitely questionable. And can I just add on the Arkansas case too? Because that case just said that those allegations were sufficient to survive a motion to dismiss, mm -hmm. and that it, the court was not going to reach these other issues of foreseeability of, of of the length of period of time. And it just it threw those out there, but it just said for purposes of a motion to dismiss. And 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 it, Justice Ginsburg who wrote that decision said, I want to be perfectly clear. This is all we're doing here today. And and you know, actually spent a whole lot of time in that decision saying, don't take things in a decision out of context. And it says something like the number one rule of statutory and case law interpretation is read on. Yeah. And, yeah. and so they really went out of their way to say, these are things we're talking about, but we're not deciding today. Mm -hmm. It's just that. And, and I think the judge in St. Bernard Parish took that and, and ran a long way. way further, yeah. And just, just to bring it back to Rhode Island, there's a case, um, and it's kind of funny, because you had a case, someone said we're kind of Lincoln in your presentation, Jennifer, and it was like somebody with an H. Uh, versus Town of Lincoln, and there is another case of somebody in the nature versus Town of Lincoln, it's called Harris versus Town of Lincoln. And Harris versus Town of Lincoln, the town had sewage pumping station that was stacked, <laughs> and it really drove a neighbor out of their home. And Maureen McKenna Goldberg, writing for a state Supreme Court, had no problem saying, this is like a, a nuisance, a private nuisance type liability, you know, and you're liable for the fair rental value of that home for the time they had to make it. And then there was also a takings claim, and she said, of course, it's not a taking. The taking is a taking of the property interest. So at least here in Rhode Island, there, was <laughs> there is that distinction between taking and court, and I think we have to insist upon it. And, and also, the, um, there were many people who brought a tort claim in New Orleans as well, and they lost because under the Federal Tort Claims Act, well, first they won, actually. First, the Fifth Circuit said, yes, this is a tort. Then, without real explanation, the Fifth Circuit reversed itself and said, no, this falls into the uh, discretionary function exception to the Federal Tort Claims Act. So they lost, but then later they won on the takings claim. So it's not really, you know, like what you said before, it's not meaningless. It's not just trading one liability for the other. Right, it does and that's matter. why you have to force them over into the tort side, where at least we have mm -hmm. a chance. It's questionable whether it's right. discretionary function, actually. That's, that's a legitimate argument. Yeah. One, one last question, Don. Um, more of a statement to circle back to the practicality of what you asked, uh, what we could do or what you yeah. could do. We're gonna, we're gonna. Uh, I don't want to hear it, but I just want to let you know that both Julia and Therese are going to be up here for kind of a wrap up. So I don't know if that would be a better choice for them or to us. Whatever you want to do, it's up to you. No, I'm gonna go with you guys. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> what do you got? As a solicitor, I would not recommend that my town undertake to try to regulate building or rebuilding <coughs> on people's property unless the enabling legislation was substantially strengthened and became much more specific and much less general as a start. Preferably, I would like to see the state legislature do what they did with DEM and tell towns that are regulating wetlands on top of wetlands. And you can't do that anymore. The state's going to control the state wetlands. And I think that I would, you guys have all the data, you guys have all the maps, you guys have all the overlays, and I would prefer to see Coastal Resources Management Council take control over regulating whether people are going to be able to build or rebuild on any, we have 39 cities in town, not all of them are excuse me, affected by it, but rather than have every city in town 
town try to adopt their own plan or approach to this, I'd rather see the legislature direct the CRMC <coughs> like they directed me. One observation on that. So is the CRMC members here. Uh, other than making CRMC the state zoning board, which I don't think it wants to do, uh, one of the problems I think it might have with that, Don, uh, is to see if that works maybe well within the recognized coastal zone, the sector of things beyond the digital feature, et cetera, et cetera. But what about the, what's coming down the pipe that Teresa talked about earlier on uh, riverine flooding, on uh, flooding that's coming down the, the uh, Blackstone Valley uh, watershed. It's going to impact Lincoln. It's going to impact uh, Pawtucket. It's going to impact a lot of inland cities that have nothing to do with storm surge, but everything to do with rivers. Those cities and towns need the same kind of solid that you guys do. I'm not sure that given CRMC, the regulatory authority zone, even further inland than what already has. It's such a grand idea. I'm not going to speak for the council or no whatever, but just going to just going to say that. Um, can we transition into, into Teresa and Julia right now? But I, I see hands up there. But and you, could, you guys, uh, you can you guys come up? Your turn. Yeah, because Etcheverry. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. In this last session, last part of the session, and thank you everybody for um, thank you everybody for sticking with us all day. It's uh, this has been a really good discussion, and we're so as somebody who's been involved in this body, this work for the last three years, and now involved in the beach stamp as much as I am. It's so great to be able to talk about these complex topics with knowledgeable uh, people more so than just our, our smaller team. Um, so I, we, Julia and I wanted to um, really end the day um, by asking you all how can we help you. With all the discussion that we've had today, we really want to know what kind of resources um, you all need to start to get your municipalities um, mobilized around this topic. And we just heard one idea, um, but I just wanted to, and Julia, do you want to add anything to? Um, I, I think we heard actually a few ideas. Um, so I was writing them down in that last session. Folks are definitely willing or happy to listen to them again, so I'll put them down during this session. Um, I thought Jen's comment about um, having a bank of experts that could be called in for um, any time that um, there's a lack of municipal capability at looking at um, certain permits was a, a great idea. Um, and that's something we can certainly look into establishing um, and finding folks to, to serve <coughs> on. Um, Pam earlier during a break brought up the idea that we have our property guide, which has 10 questions um, that someone may be asking when looking at a specific property and um, question whether or not we could have a guide like that for legal questions. And I thought, you know, that, that's a good way to start off this conversation. Um, you know, if we were to have 10 questions that we really need to ask, 10 legal questions that would be a, a helpful guide to give to municipalities in thinking through some of these issues, what would those 10 questions be? But I don't want to plant too many ideas. I really want to hear what you guys have to tell us. And I know Teresa feels the same way. Yeah? Well, I think Jennifer and, and John's presentations are a very good outline of the type of information that you need to share. Um, it, is this is this type of activity a taking? In what circumstances might it, might it be? Um, I think that <coughs> that was very good presentations, and, and the order of that was just just perfect. Um, I would add to that though a little primer um, or information primer on, and I don't know how you ask these in the form of a question. I would never go with Jeopardy, so. Um, but, uh, thinking of a little primer on both comprehensive other forms of land use uh, law in Rhode Island, um, and then um, so <coughs> thumbnails of certain cases um, specific to Rhode Island. Um, because there are some quotable quotes, like more than a scintilla, less than a preponderance. Mm -hmm. Everyone should know that it's perfectly clear. Um, and those are the types of things that I think would be good. 
great time and asset. Other thoughts, ideas? How many? Yeah, okay. One, one. No, I was just going to say, um, I guess I thought the presentations were great, and I'm wondering if it should trickle down to like volunteer board members and how much would they, because it's, it's a lot of information, and you kind of do need to have a little bit of background. Cause some, anyway, I'm wondering if um, like a list of resources for like a beginner's guide or something. Um, and I'm saying this because I just joined a planning board in my town, so I'm thinking of like what I would need. And uh, maybe like an online module or something that people could do self-paced in low bits, because I know it's hard to get out those books to workshops. Mm -hmm. So maybe something like that. I don't yeah. know. Great idea. Sir. Uh, this isn't so much a comment or It's more just a general statement as to what kind of what Donnie was saying earlier. Um, Obviously, we all think this is a, a big issue that we need to plan for, what we need to do, but I think putting it on the backs of municipalities is most likely a pipe dream. Because the people aren't, we don't have the mechanisms to do it. We don't have, many, many towns don't have the mechanisms to stop the mansions that are going up. How are we going to deny somebody the right to develop their property? Um, not only that, but from town to town, we have different dynamics, different people. There's going to be no consistency. And it would be effective, it would be ineffective for to rely on independent towns to, to implement it. I think more than lines what Donnie was saying is having one state body create some kind of rule in district or something that would weigh in on these properties that are damaged by storms under certain circumstances. And if they extend inland, it mimics the same um, <coughs> same way that DEM does with CRMC with their wells. You know, the city of the coastal <coughs> I mean, we have DEM permit septic systems. Towns have no say in that. That's not a problem. That works out fine. But I think to be effective, it needs to come from one body that has the ability to push that and to be consistent across the board. Otherwise, really, it's going to be winging a prayer for her, hoping to get a town to actually stand up and say, yes, we're going to do it, and, and deal with the ramifications afterwards. I mean, Forget about just everything that we can't build on it. Now we have to rely on diminishing tax base and everything else. It makes it really hard to, to, to see it being effective. Okay, so more state guidance. So along those lines, I was thinking of maybe of like a long ordinance. If you, if you find you know something that you could develop, um, and I think you know uh, Rima does that. With the flood zone in ordinance. capture that dynamic conflicting development <laughs> concepts I'm I get what you're I'm picking up what you're throwing down but I'm trying to capture it in a and blurb then, what was the second thing so you said uh, <coughs> um, there's some going to the to development yeah I think conflicting yeah. development concepts uh, or requirements yeah regs yeah. yeah okay yeah, I, I don't know if, if any that has come up before but I FEMA does draw the line with uh, quarter zones and not allowing okay. 
construction in them. Okay. And if they do, they, they, they can't get insurance. They're uninsurable and uh, out of the way they handle that. So okay. I think maybe in this case that the, these, the, these vulnerable areas are these areas that get damaged, get treated. Like, well, I don't know how you're. So I think, right. So I call it that zone? The, co the Coastal Barrier Resources Act, CBRA. And those zones are mapped by FEMA, but not every town has those COVID zones. So as a complement to the model ordinance, you almost need to have a mapping <coughs> that determines where municipalities should prohibit <coughs> development or prohibit rebuilding. And then the, the, the mapping would go along with the model ordinance and towns would adopt both. That's very similar to the FEMA, the FEMA model. Before you get to model ordinance, the state like state enabling has to grant the authority to the communities to zone for this specific purpose. The more explicit they can be about that, the better. Um, because it, it's an authorization, it's a delegation of that police power. Um, but I, to get back to Jason's point, I believe what he's trying to say is we're more than happy to let the state do the regulation the state take charge of that. Um, this way, it's not on the backs of communities. We don't have to worry about whether or not there's a planner or a GIS specialist in, in the community to actually be able to handle this stuff. Um, but if you, before you get to a model ordinance, you have to have specific enabling legislation. And there is precedent for it, as I said earlier, in a couple of areas, um, specifically housing, um, and we should utilize that um, as we kind of sell that this is the next step. That would be on the EC4 and their work um, is probably going to be the way that this is done. My, my last comment would be that um, all of us at the municipal level, we can work from the bottom up in trying to change minds and, and improve the culture and the attitudes of the local government. Um, but the state agencies really are from the top down. Um, and I know you answer to other people, so you know, you know, you know what kind of uh, concerns those are. But without the elected officials at the state level owning this idea and um, understanding that they're living up to responsibility, um, there's really not much that we, we can do. Right. Well, I just I have a question for Grover or Brian. But is CRMC's jurisdiction currently based on where the current location of the coastal feature is, <laughs> even though you know that coastal feature will be changing in the next 20 plus years? change, you still only have the ability today, if somebody brought in an application, uh, to, to regulate within X number of feet of the coastal feature. Right. Well, well, we have two types of jurisdiction. We have below me water, exclusive jurisdiction. Yes. <laughs> and then we have above me and high water, which is concurrent with, with, with the municipality. It's 200 feet inland from the coastal, coastal, coastal physiographic feature that necessary to carry out meaningful maps. So, I'm just saying that perhaps Changing that jurisdictional uh, definition. You have a point, and we didn't get to it because it's much more important. <coughs> listen to you guys, and you've listened to me. My presentation is going to be on that point, and it's about, it talks about a common law doctrine of revulsion and how that would work in Rhode Island, because the courts have been very silent in Rhode Island on the issue of revulsion. And the theory there is that we know we've litigated to death. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Brian. Thank you. Here, the issue of the public trust doctrine, the Mehigh Water, and Gibson, and me, and the whole nine yards are where the Mehigh Tidal Line is, and where, where, where the property law, private property, and public property differ. The doctrine of revulsion is completely different. It's a property law doctrine, even though the property owner may retain ownership for purposes of a migratory shoreline from which you establish your setback to be taken from 
the avulsion line that occurred as of the last storm. I mean, this was discussed in Severance versus Patterson down in Texas, and a few other cases that I was going to put up there. Um, it, it, it's something that I think has some teeth, and I, I'll gladly talk to you about Brian. I want to talk to Brian and go for any way I'm out here, because Severance Patterson and some of the case law, great example, Rhode Island, uh, seems to support the idea of this whole common law theory of abolition where a property owner has a reasonable right to walk out back to the original timeline um, kind of may not be as good as Well, I mean, the CRPC jurisdiction is simply man-made law. They can right. change it without having to stick to a scientific. Theory. No, this is a legal principle because what you don't want to do is start to run afoul of any public trust document property lines because the Supreme Court has already spoken on that. Don't want to get into a PTD argument. We want well, to get into a more of a property law argument. CRC could say, or the, the, the legislature could say, uh, CRC now has jurisdiction within all areas uh, where uh, in, mapping shows in, you know a five foot sea level rise would, would affect that area. So, I mean, that. All right. Other ideas? Has there been any buzz on the street in any municipalities of legal challenges related to storm events, past or more recent? Um, what, I, I, this has been going back and forth on the regulatory front, I realize, but part of what we're trying to provide the city, cities and towns with, and as I discussed a little bit, is infrastructure fuels development. And cities and towns are controlling the infrastructure and what gets repaired or rebuilt <coughs> and by standard. That is going to have some sort of throttle on development. And I think that is an area where the cities and towns can play a greater role. Uh, it becomes a greater <coughs> role, I realize, but it is a role <coughs> that they can play in terms of what they, where they expand the infrastructure or where they don't expand the infrastructure in terms of these events. I just wanted to say, in keeping with some of the things that are sort of underlying there, sort of on the education front and getting the message across to the municipalities, the EC4 Advisory Board is working on that specific thing, trying to do basically what we're doing here today, specifically to planning boards and zoning boards, and, and sort of get the, get the topic before them so they know what questions to at least be considering. So it's not really buzz on the street about legal issues, mm -hmm. but it's something that is being worked on at a different level. Um, so <coughs> stay tuned, I guess. But it's it's a topic that's being knocked around a lot. Okay. You have a bunch of hands. So, as soon as I hear something to that, yeah. is I think we should what we should also add a bunch of officials. Um, I think we've been moving them out a lot of this process. With well, elected officials. Oh yeah. It's 
one of two major tools they have, comp planning and the review process. And that's what it is. It's actually <coughs> review. And there's standards and there's, there's performance standards that apply as well as specific procedures. And they can gain a lot of credibility by applying those procedures and those standards over and over and over in the exact same way. So provided that the process is in place and the standards are in place, a planning board should, should feel secure in the decision that they're making. And the other thing is they, they are protected from liability. As long as they're doing their job as a planning board, they're protected from liability. And there is an extensive appeal process. There has to be an agreement party. And most of the time, you avoid those questions of takings um, and, and, and in those situations. If you simply follow the process, to the letter. So um, I would suggest that the idea that there's a predictable process and there's regulations in place that you apply fairly across the board to everybody is one of your, the best defensive mechanisms for community. We'll have to add to our checklist. You've got to add to the checklist, ask for more information. Of course, then there'll probably be legislation that probably well, yeah, can, but the we'll legislature said we couldn't add more things to our checklist. No, we successfully <laughs> defeated that one. So. That's why I said last year. With, with, re, with regards to, we've been talking about planning boards and planning boards and conservation commission. Um, to my knowledge, there's no requirement for training for any of these boards. Is that correct? <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, is, there, for that for years. <laughs> is that something yeah. that needs to be? But I mean, this is only one small part of the bigger picture. But is that something that needs to be put into zoning and neighbor <coughs> enabling legislation? I to think with the, yeah, the land use training club that has been talking about that for years and yeah. pushing it, and it's always on our minds, and we want to do something about it, but it's just what's the best mechanism. It was, it was affirmatively rejected by the General Assembly 25 years ago. Yes. study commission on the economic impact economic risk due to sea level rise and coastal hazards is that right is that what's called anybody and inland flooding, yeah. and inland flooding. yes um, so Grover <laughs> myself Caitlin and Liz all four of us are here um, went in front of that commission a few weeks ago and I know there is a call for more economic data and economic analysis <coughs> to provide that to municipalities but here, here. There's no plan in place, but it's definitely a need that we keep hearing um, in multiple with multiple audiences. Thanks for bringing that up. Um, on the subject of online modules, I definitely like the idea of an online module geared to members of local review boards. But also, um, it would be nice to have that for applicants. Um, and I think distilling a lot of this information down into um, you know the concepts and if there was a way that the module would force them to enter their property address and view the, the um, flood maps and sea level rise maps, I think that would really function as a very effective <coughs> versus just having them sign a document, yes, I acknowledge that I know this say a plan exists and um, if, if we could actually force them to go through a module and, and, and look at this. And, you know, sign yeah. off. They agree to that. Yep. One of the other things I was thinking of, I had seen this at a different workshop, maybe it was done in Rhode Island, I can't remember, where um, uh, people went out and took blue napkin tape and they went to, like, a neighborhood or a, an area and they um, measured um, 
what sea level rise will do, and they put blue tape on the, you know, on the buildings yeah. as a, sort of a visual. Yeah. Um, because I think it's kind of overwhelming, and I think people, if you get people to, you know, see it and be there, be yeah. and, and really be there, I think yeah. it's, it's, a, it's a concept that not everybody maybe understands. Any other final thoughts on this? So this idea of requiring uh, permit applicants, whether it be at the local level or the state level, to sort of go through this online module, um, that might be able to be paired up with an online permit application process. So right now, the State Building Commissioner's Office is paired up with 10 communities in Rhode Island in a pilot project to have a consistent online um, building, local building application process. So essentially, you enter in the information there, and you're consistently asked the same information, regardless of what community you go into. And so maybe as part of that application process, they you know enter all this information, and certain maps pop up that show the parcel in relation to sea level rise and flood zones and erosion hazards and things like that. Um, maybe, maybe that can be paired up. Who knows? Maybe it's possible. <laughs> all right. With well, lots of money. <laughs> so, fun day. Now we're going to talk about that. Okay. Yeah. Here's what, because come back to the, the legal issues here. We have had a good conversation there with some of the um, some of the municipal officials and some of the legal counsel. I'm just wondering um, to our legal folks, how can we reach out to some of your colleagues? What is another way to do that? Is there a conference? Is there um, so right continuing education credits? You know, so it would be good to know. If you have some suggestions on how to reach a broader audience, I think the annual meeting of our association would be a great place to um, present a seminar topic or at least have a, a table there. And that's coming up in June. But that's an annual okay. event. That's a great point. That would be great. And then, are there other ways for students to engage? You know, so, so we have this awesome cadre of, of law students. I'm just wondering how. You know, given the parameters of your program, are there any other ways that, you know, John Henry, you've done a great job. It's been really, really wonderful to have him work with us. And, you know, then we see. Yeah. And we see the students then going out and getting jobs and working in firms and informing the rest of us. So um, I guess that would be another question. Is there, um, more ways for some of the students to maybe do some internships with with municipalities, with um, legal firms, et cetera, to get the word out there because this is their their generation as well. Those are great ideas. Um, I think we can build off of those ideas. I know that Teresa and I are planning on sitting down with this document and with our ideas from today. Um, to flush out sort of how we as a Rhode Island Secret Legal Program can support this work moving forward. And then we'll bring that discussion to the larger Beach Sound uh, team to talk about that. So um, if you guys do have opportunities for students, please do feel free to contact me and I will get you in touch with the appropriate students or appropriate divisions here at the law school, whether it's to have a student work on work with you for pro bono hours or work through our law fellow program or work as an externship program. Um, there's lots of different opportunities there. I just want to add that one of the things that we've really focused on coastal resilience and coastal adaptation today. We talked a little bit about Riverine, but one of the things that we're starting to tighten up our messaging and language on is using the word climate change a little less often and focusing more on the hazard because we're, you know, in the work that we did in North Kingstown, we, you know, call it climate change. We really just focus on sea level rise and coastal hazards. We didn't talk about drought or excessive heat or um, 
um, you know, food systems, that kind of stuff. And, and climate change impacts different sectors of our state. So I think that's another thing just to keep in mind as you're having conversations for us to be specific about what aspect of climate change we're, we're tackling at any given time. Grover showed that um, flow chart of our model process for municipalities. We had all the arrows keep going up to scope because one of the things we've learned through our municipal work is that any conversation, and it happened here today too, goes in a thousand different directions. So it's a challenge to everybody to kind of come back into like, what are we really trying to hone in on so that you can be specific and targeted in implementation strategies and not get too diluted, dilute, diluted, and diluted <laughs> in your mission of what you're trying to tackle at any given time. So I just wanted to share that, air, that word of caution. And inspiration. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good idea because I think we, we do go sideways sometimes. And I, I also went to a workshop years ago that I thought was fantastic, and it was called Water Words That Work. <laughs> and it was a way to talk the talk and keep uh, consensus building without um, creating um, confrontation. The yeah. certain buzzwords um, will set people off. And that was that's maybe part of the education. Thank you. Impact. I learned impact.